presentation. Uh, sorry for the uh, disorganization here. I, you know, I've been teaching for 30 years, and I've never been pushed to the absolute limit of my physical and mental capacities the way I have this year. And uh, I'm just, I'm sorry I can't give you the quality of uh, instruction that I would normally be able to give, but uh, this, this, this quarter and this year especially has just been really challenging, because I'm sure it has for you as well. But um, boy, I've just been really, uh, just the way I teach, my style, I need more time to prepare than what I've, what I've had. In particular, I need, a, I need at least a week before a term starts to get myself together. And that didn't happen either in winter or spring. It's like things started in October, end of September, and I never had a chance to catch my breath. And I'm, I'm tired. I'm sorry about that. Mm -hmm. It's really frustrating when I. I can't even get my material posted before class time, which is really frustrating. <laughs> Does that look like it's off? It's off, yeah. It's off? Yeah. Today we, we will be joined by uh, guests in the second hour, um, and she's going to join us by Zoom. Assuming I can get the Zoom working, I had trouble um, getting my Zoom account to work on the on the, on the computer uh, in the classroom computer, and I, I don't know if I can get sound on my 
laptop. I hope between the two we can get we can get to work. Um, but I wanted to just uh, pick up where I left off last time with the dedicated outdoor air system. Um, we had an example of, uh, or I had an example that I wanted to work through here to show how we do, uh, how we design a DOAS system. It's a little bit different from a regular system in that um, because the DOAS, it has to work with the, a, another system. It has to have a supplemental uh, HVAC to deal with the sensible heat. Uh, because the, uh, if, if you just use the DOAS alone, in, in most cases, not all cases, like the example that, or the one you have on your homework is uh, a system that's designed to work solely with the dedicated outdoor air system. But in most cases, except for sensitive applications like hospital operating rooms or, or labs or places like that, the DOAS will deal uh, with just the ventilation air. So you'll split up the, the ventilation from the return air and the DOAS will uh, condition the ventilation air, and uh, it will condition it to whatever uh, humidity is needed to maintain comfort conditions in the space. And then the return air just gets cycled back and, back and forth, and that's mainly controlled to, uh, for the sense of it. So that is monitoring, or that's controlling the dry bulb temperature while the DOAS is controlling the humidity, but actually both systems usually can do can work on, on both ends, on both humidity and temperature. It's just the DOAS is focused, its control point is the humidity and the something little system is focusing on the dry bulb temperature. Um, and uh, so typically, um, the room condition will be here at five. This will be the return air but the supply air from the DOAS will be at four. And usually the, uh, the DOAS, um, the conditioning unit on the DOAS produces supply air between 40 and 50 degrees at 100% relative humidity. And then uh, the sensible wheel here warms it up. It provides the, the reheat to bring it up to you know, a comfortable temperature for distributing into the into the space. Um, but then this air will mix with air from uh, the other the, the the separate system that that just works on the return air, or there'll be some other kind of a of a heating or a cooling system, such as a radiant radiant panels or chill beams are commonly used with DOAS, but you could also have. A, um, something that's electric or uh, an underfloor radiant system. And together, they'll work to maintain the room at the set point temperature and, and humidity. Um, the sensible wheel here tends to be more on high-end systems or systems that really uh, have especially challenging humidity control uh, situations. And um, so I had this example here uh, where we have a, a DOAS system that works on 1200 CFM of outside air. So it's just purely outside air. And uh, the goal here is to condition that air to the space temperature and humidity and, uh, and then exhaust the air back out to the, uh, to the surrounding. And uh, the goal here is to, we want to figure out what the conditions of, I want to figure out the conditions of the air at all of the state points, but especially the state four, which is the supply air to the space to give us 78 degrees and 50% uh, and humidity. And the method here is, uh, it shows the design method that's used for, uh, for DOAS. So I'm going to pull that up here. And uh, I, I found it. Um, I had to dig, dig around, but this was actually I had this stored on a uh, on, on uh, archived on the campus uh, storage system. I don't 
remember what, why it was there and not on my local computer. But anyway, so this is the system here. We have a, a space that has a, a total cooling load of 80,000 BTU per hour and a sensible heat ratio of 0.8. <coughs> So 0.8 times that, or what, 64,000 BTU per hour will be the sensible load and the rest will be latent. Um, and we want to figure out the cooling uh, requirement here to uh, meet the space conditions. We have um, an energy wheel here that can control both the sensible and the latent. So this can exchange sensible energy and latent energy between the two streams, whereas this one is just a sensible wheel, or call this an energy recovery ventilator, a heat recovery. This, this one can only uh, exchange sensible energy between the two streams. And uh, it's got 95 degree Fahrenheit coming in, 55%. Um, so we're going to work this out on the psychometric chart and show how, how we can locate each of the state points. Starting with the outside air, which we can locate easily because that's given as 95 degrees, 55%. And we'll call that point zero, and just go zero to five. Um, and we can write down what our properties are that we'll need for our uh, analysis, the humidity uh, and uh, the enthalpy and the specific volume. And we can locate the, uh, our space condition here, which is right in the center of the diagram, 0.5. 50%, 78 degrees, and we can read off our, our values there. Now, uh, in the winter time, we would use the preheat coil. If it gets cold enough, uh, this, this would be uh, set to turn on when the temperature dropped below a certain value out, outdoors just to prevent the coil from freezing up, or prevent damage, really to prevent damage to the, to the wheel here. The wheel is sensible to, or sensitive to, um, especially sensitive to temperature because it has a, either, a, some, in some cases it has a liquid uh, desiccant, or in other cases it has a solid desiccant, but they're, uh, they can be damaged if uh, ice build, it builds up on them. But this is a summer situation here, so we're not going to be concerned with the uh, preheat. So state one and state zero are the same. And, uh, and now to, uh, to, to determine the properties at state four, we need to do an energy balance around the space. And we're gonna equate the energy in with the energy out. So just a, applying the first law to that space. So we have the, set, the total energy coming in, this is from the, uh, the, the heat load, plus the energy being brought in at, um, at four here, and that has to equal what goes out. So it's just what, what goes in equals what comes out at state, uh, at state five, which would be the return air, or in this case, it's really just, uh, we call it, sometimes we call it return air, but it's, it's all going to exhaust with the system. And then a uh, latent energy balance is, uh, we're just balancing uh, around the, the water component, where the latent load is 1076, which is the enthalpy of vaporization of water at, I think this is at 60, around 60 degrees or something like that, but at the temperature that's common, it's the ASHRAE standard for uh, temperatures typical for uh, HVAC conditions. And, uh, and then the amount of water that's being uh, evaporated. So that's our total in our latent balance. And, uh, and then we can solve the, the latent balance here, uh, we can actually, uh, well, we can calculate what our latent load is based on this, off the, specific, the sensible heat ratio, um, 16,000 BTU per hour. And 
then we can calculate our mass flow. We note that the moisture at five is equal to the moisture at six because the wheel here cannot change the moisture, it can only change the temperature of the air. So five and six are equal, and three and four are equal. So we're not changing the water, co uh, water content. Um, so we can solve for the moisture at four, which is the unknown here. And we just need to figure out now what the mass flow rate of air is. And we can get that from our incoming volume flow rate and the specific volume at the incoming state, which is 14.42. So our mass flow rate is 4993 pounds of dry air per hour. And that's the same all the way through because we're just running the same air all the way through the system, changing the moisture in different parts, places, but the dry air component is the same. So there's our mass flow rate of dry air. And now we can figure out what our uh, humidity ratio at four is by just solving here with plugging in our known quantities and we get 0 0.0073. And uh, we can make a note of that, the moisture at four. And then we can uh, locate that on the chart. We've got to go to grains here because this is the uh, the train chart, so 0 0.0073 is 51.3 grains. So this will be our humidity ratio at four, which will also be the humidity ratio at three. And then um, our humidity ratio at five, which is also our humidity ratio at six. So we have one of the properties now, we just need to find another property so we can locate the point. Well, in state three, we're uh, given that if we're saturated air coming off the cooling coil, which means it's 100% relative humidity, or it's at the dew point, so that locates uh, state three right here on the saturation curve. And then we can get the temperature. We can read off the temperature as, what was it? about 50 uh, or 40, uh, 49 degrees, somewhere around 49 degrees. So now we can do uh, an energy balance, an enthalpy, or an enthalpy balance around the sensible wheel and solve for the unknown enthalpy. Um, we can also do a temperature bound. We can just swap out the humidity with the temperature. And we have two unknown temperatures here, and we can use the effectiveness to find, the, uh, find those temperatures. Similar to what we do with a you know, regenerative Brayton cycle. So the effectiveness equal to 0.7, the effectiveness T3 minus T4. What we're trying to do here is get, we're trying to get T3 up to T5, or H3 up to H5. And uh, this sensible wheel can get us 70% of the way there. And uh, so we can solve for the unknown temperature, which in this case is T4. And uh, that gives us 69.3 degrees. And uh, now we can locate state four because uh, the moisture is, uh, is, is, is here. And we calculate the temperature 69.3 degrees. And, uh, and that locates the condition of the air that is going into the space. So the supply air. 69.3 degrees and whatever W4, W3, W4.0073.
And then T6, we can calculate that now that we know T4, and that's 57.7 degrees. <coughs> There's uh, 57.7 degrees, but we need another property to locate um, state six. Yeah, and that property is state, uh, the moisture six is equal to the moisture of five, so we can locate it right there. And it's just about right on the saturation curve. So um, this is our supply air coming up off the cooling coil, it's cold. Uh, but the goal here, it's not so much the cooling, it's getting the humidity low enough so that when we put it into the space and then it mixes with the air in the space, the humidity is low enough for people to be comfortable in a, you know, in a hot, humid climate. Um, so we don't want to put this air into the space. People are going to be freezing if we do that. Uh, and we don't want to reheat with energy, you know, with an electrical coil, because that costs money, so why not just take the return air that's already comfortable and draw some of the energy out of that, and we get a double bang for the buck here, because getting this cooler will help when the air gets over here to the energy wheel, because here we want to pre-cool the incoming air. So when this air gives up its energy to this stream, it actually helps it to cool, pre-cool the outside air. Yes, sir? Uh, I thought the purpose of the wheels they had like desk in it, that was supposed to remove humidity, so how is it the humidity ratio is the same? Yeah, uh, it does on, on this one. There, there's two types of wheels. One is, uh, one does absorb moisture, but the other one doesn't. It's just a, a heat exchanger. Okay, this one's just showing the Passing of air and transfer. Yeah, yeah, it's just a heat, a heat exchanger. Those are quite a bit cheaper because they don't have the, the desiccant uh, and, 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 and uh, the extra components that the, the enthalpy wheel has. And we don't really, at this point, we, we've already got the moisture to where we need it coming off the cooling coil, so there's not really any, any need to further adjust the moisture. And in, actually, in most applications, we don't even we don't even need this. The 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 the, the temperature is satisfactory. Maybe a little cool, but uh, it will adjust when it gets entrained in the air in the space. Plus, it mixes with the the, uh, the air that's coming off the other uh, conditioning system that complements the DOAS system. Okay, um, so then we move over to the, the enthalpy wheel to locate the properties at, uh, at, at two. We need the properties at two in order to figure out our cooling load. So we do an energy balance around the enthalpy wheel and we're looking for state two here. So our energy balance, uh, energy in equals energy out, so we're going in H, H1 minus H2 is H6, or H out, that doesn't have a number, we'll just call it out, minus uh, H6. We don't need the mass flows here because the mass is, is, the two streams have equal mass flows, which is so they divide out. And we have the two unknowns, H2 and H out, but just as we did with the sensible wheel, we can use the effectiveness to get one of these unknowns here, which in this case is H2, from the definition of the effectiveness. So here we're trying to get, we've got hot, you know, high energy, hot air coming in from outside, and we want to try to cool that, get it as close as we can to the temperature here at state six, which is 57.7 degrees. Um, and uh, we can get 80% of the way there. So we're going to come out here a little bit warmer than 57.7, but that's what we're aiming for. And uh, so we can solve for H2, and plugging in the node quantities, we get 28.8 for our enthalpy, 
And uh, so we can now locate one of the properties here for, uh, uh, for state two. We know the enthalpy, there it is, 28.8. So we're gonna be somewhere on that line, right? And, uh, and so now we can solve, knowing, uh, knowing H2, um, we can now uh, write our, our effectiveness in terms of temperatures and solve for the temperature at two, and that will give us the second point that we need to find um, where we are at state two. Okay, so look at this. Look at how just these two streams passing each other, we were able to reduce the energy in that outside air from way up here all the way down to here. So this, this is gonna reduce the work that has to be done by the cooling coil. It's gonna help us save on the refrigeration cost. Um, and uh, so there's our, our moisture. We can make a note of what the moisture is. And, uh, and then we can calculate our enthalpy out which we really don't need to figure out the cooling load, but uh, it, this just brings completeness to our analysis. H out, uh, so uh, H out, we're gonna be up closer now to the outside air, this is our exhaust, and then the uh, moisture at uh, 0 0.0180. And this is from our moisture balance around the, uh, the enthalpy wheel. It allows us to calculate the moisture coming out. And we've now located all of our points, our thermodynamic property points at, uh, for each place in the system here. And now we can look at what's going on. We can see that uh, we're coming in and bringing in outside air at zero. And, uh, and then we're we're cooling it as it flows through the enthalpy wheel, and it's being cooled by this air that's passing by. So this air from six to seven is leaving. So you see this air is nice and cool, and it's heading out, and it's absorbing latent and sensible energy from that outside air and bringing it down to two. That's a, that's a lot of cooling without adding any energy, you know, without refrigeration or some kind of active you know, mechanical. We do need fans. And you can see the fans there. And uh, these systems do have uh, significant pressure drops. So it's not cheap. So you really have to do, be careful in doing the economic analysis to make sure that this is going to be feasible. And, and, and you're actually getting an economic benefit from it. Okay, so now uh, two, to, two to three, this is our refrigeration. So now we're passing through and uh, our chilled water or our refrigerant. Generally, we use chilled water. Chilled water works better with no ass compared to just direct refrigerant. Um, chilled water, we have better control over the, the chilled water flow in, through our cooling coil than we do with refrigerant. And uh, so we come out at three, and uh, now we're really cold. <laughs> we're cold and dry. Good stuff, right? Um, but too cold to put into the, in, in, really in most cases, we wouldn't be quite that cold. Well, actually we would. Um, yeah, because this, this is actually a little bit warm for a doas. Often we're down here, um, but the, the, the nature of the system and how it is, is often we, we just take this air and then we mix it with return air and plenum and then put the mixture into the space. But we can also just put this directly into the space and allow for it to be entrained with the room air and to mix with the uh, air that's coming like from the chilled beam or from some other uh, place, some, our, some other process. So we come off the cooling coil and then we go through polish it up, make it a little more comfortable. Just sensible heating, so no change in moisture. It brings us up to four. 
And we do that by taking our return air from the room and it's warmer, so it's going to pass off some energy to our, uh, the air coming off the cooling coil. And then this is the air that goes either into the space or it mixes with return air somewhere. And you, you, you can't do this, you wouldn't do this by itself. And you can probably see the reason if you look at the sensible heat ratio here, it's 0.8. And uh, that sensible heat ratio is. Uh, where, where, where is it? Um, well, here it is. So if you draw a line from point eight and uh, let's intersect here, it's going to go something like that. So in this air, if you were to put this air in the room, it's going to warm up. It's going to follow a slope like this. It's going to follow that sensible heat ratio slope, and it's going to warm up. Uh, but it's going to it's going to be colder and drier than your set point. Okay, so uh, thus the need for some other form of uh, conditioning to bring, bring the temperature and humidity to the desired set point. But anyway, uh, so we take all of the properties and we put them here on a uh, table. Um, that's what they look like. And then uh, I just calculated the CFM based off of the mass flow rate and the specific volume at each point, and then adjusted them to the standard. This should be the same all the way through since the air is uh, it's just one stream of air. We're not combining streams of air. So 1109 CF, uh, SCFM, so that's what we would size our fan to. And we get that, remember, we get this by uh, multiplying by the dense, the uh, uh, the specific volume of standard conditions, which is 13.33. So you take this number, multiply by 13.33, and then divide by the actual specific volume. And you do that for each of the streams here. And then this is what we would size our fan to. So we would need a fan to, to, to move 1109 CFM at whatever the pressure drop is. Now, pressure drops through these things tend to run about 0.5 inches of water, 0.5 to 0.7. Um, and then you have to add in all the other stuff. Okay, so this is similar to your, uh, there's a homework problem, but your homework problem is, is actually quite a bit simpler. You know, not, not having this second wheel greatly simplifies the analysis. So hopefully, um, and, and actually, I, I, I'm going to post this. Uh, I, I, I have this set up to make a little video to, to, to show to show it through. So that's, that's coming as soon as I can sit down at my computer and put this up there. And uh, so there's what we have. Uh, so now we can do we can calculate what our cooling load is, right? So here's uh, just do our energy balance around the coil, um, Q coil. Uh, the, enthal the, uh, the enthalpy difference, and then the, uh, we have to take out the energy taken away by the water. That water is leaving at this temperature at T T3, 49 degrees. So uh, the enthalpy of liquid water at 49 degrees, we we'll look that up, and we get uh, 45 thousand. BTU per hour, so about 3.75 tons of, of cooling uh, from our, our refrigeration unit to make this work. So if you think about a typical system today, you know, you, ventilation air might be one third, a quarter to a third of the total air. So this is 1,200, you know, you're going to have a system that's uh, working on maybe three times this amount of air, uh, if, if it's an all-air system, to provide the sensible cooling. Or we can have a chill beam like what we have here, which is just has cooling water flowing through. And, and actually, I'm not sure if this is active or passive. Do you, do you remember if they said whether it was active? Active would mean there's a fan up there that's blowing 
It's actually drawing <laughs> air out of the room and mixing it with, I think it's passive. They said it was passive. Passive, yeah. So it's just cooling water. So the chilled water from the chiller plant is coming through and it's going through coils up here. And it's just relying on uh, natural convection to uh, the warm air comes up as that cool air falls down and you get this little convective current going. And uh, this is a nice way to get some cooling without, you know, ha ha having a fan dedicated to each room. So this would be a nice uh, setup for uh, adding a DOS, a DOS unit, because they actually do have ventilation issues in the summertime. Okay, so um, yeah, that's 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 it for. Um, and then the other uh, the other thing we were looking at last time was the uh, uh, cooling towers, how those work. Um, <coughs> And these use the, the principle of evaporative cooling, where you, uh, you, 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 you put warm water into air, warm water into relatively cool air, air that's cool relative to the water, and some of the water evaporates into the air. And the energy that evaporates that water comes out of the water that's left behind and it comes out of the air as well. But you end up cooling the water down a little bit and the water collects at the bottom and then it's pumped back to the condenser. And the delta T is typically 10 degrees, maybe 15 degrees, 10 degrees is, is the normal design delta T for an HVAC uh, cooling tower, which means we come in at 95 degrees from the condenser and we go back to the condenser at 85 degrees. And a key aspect of the design is to, uh, if we, uh, we put material in or design the, uh, design the, 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 the uh, structure inside the cooling tower to maximize surface area between the water and the air. You want the air and the water to have time and space to intermingle. And that allows for the, the heat transfer to take place and uh, different towers do it different ways, and a lot of these are proprietary designs, but they often have these uh, like pack, uh, these weird shaped packing materials that just force the water to zigzag. So the water gets hung up, uh, giving it time for the air to come through and they hang out together. You want them to hang out together to uh, enable the heat transfer to occur. If the water's just falling straight down and the air's coming straight up, heat transfer's not gonna be as, as effective. Um, the, uh, if you look at evaporative cooling on, the, on a psychometric chart, it is a constant enthalpy process. And uh, actually we should, we should do evaporative cooling. That is a common mode of cooling in, in very hot, dry places. Because you can really get some effective cooling that way. But on the psychometric chart, it looks like, uh, let's see, uh, lines of constant uh, enthalpy are like this, right? So where you have the ideal situation for evaporative cooling is really hot, but, but relatively dry, so you're over here. And then you spray water into this, into this hot air. So this might just be outdoors, you're sitting and there's a spray over, over top of you, and you're just spraying water. And uh, what happens is this, the, the air is uh, cool at constant enthalpy, so it moves in this direction. And you can go all the way, if you have a really effective system, you can get close to saturation. And in fact, evaporative coolers are, are typically weighted in terms of how close they get to taking you all the way to saturation. Usually you don't, you don't want 100% relative humidity, but you do want it to be, you know, 50% or something like that. And um, now for this to happen, the water that you're spraying has to be at the same temperature as the air. Um, 
So what you do, if you, if you have a, an evaporative cooler, you, it has a continuous circulation of water. And as that water circulates, uh, it, it reaches a steady state temperature that's equal to the temperature of the space that it's, it's working with. And uh, in that setup, then the cooling is constant in fact. Now, if the water is cooler, if you're spraying cold water, then it's not going to be constant in value. It's going to be a little bit different. And there, there are actually, you know, some humidifiers work that way. Some humidifiers spray steam if it's in the wintertime. In the summertime, you might spray cold water. But uh, typically, and with cooling towers, you're working with uh, the, the uh, the, the, the water as it's as it's coming as it's coming to you. Well, actually, in in, in, in a cooling tower, the uh, the water is typically warmer than the air. So on a really really hot day, it can be cooler than the air. Um, but this is uh, to, this is generally what's happening. Is you're roughly in a cooling tower, uh, a constant enthalpy. cooling of the air, and uh, the maximum cooling of the air, the maximum evaporative cooling is, is when the air reaches its wet bulb temperature, and it can't be cooled anymore, and the water can't be cooled anymore either. So the wet bulb temperature of the air puts a limit on the effectiveness of cooling towers, and that means in really hot, humid climates, cooling towers are not as effective. They, they still can be work, they still can work, but they're, uh, they're limited by that the, the, the humidity of the surrounding air. Um, but anyway, um, so that's how they work. They do work by evaporation. You do evaporate a small amount of that water, typically one to five percent of the total flow. So you have to have uh, water that comes in. Um, you have to have a continuous supply of makeup water. That means you're going to pay for city water or well water if you have a well. And uh, this is the expense that, one of the most significant expenses, operators are often trying to figure out how to you know, economize on that. And you certainly want to minimize evap you know, needless evaporation that can happen on really, really hot days. Yes? I did want to ask a quick question about that. Mm -hmm. So during the tour, where they mentioned that they have to, there was some sort of chemicals they would use in that system because yes. of that water. Was yes. that... Was the makeup water specifically from the city versus because once they run mm -hmm. that in, that ends that ends up in the chilled water. That's track. right. That's right. These are very delicate systems because it's it's warm. The water's really warm. You've got a humid environment. It's a great breeding ground for bacteria. If you've heard of Legionnaires' disease, that happened uh, in the 1970s. They had a really big uh, outbreak of that. And I think it was the first time people became aware that. These can be sources of disease if uh, if you don't keep treat this water to, to kill to kill off bacteria. And there are protocols for the chemical treatments, and we saw the chemical treatment system over there uh, that they use. And um, yeah, so you have to be really careful to, to treat this water to make sure it's you don't want to have harmful microbes growing. And you, know, you don't want to have fouling. You can get uh, fungi and algae. And you can get all kinds of crud, <laughs> as you can imagine. And uh, so the treatment is trying to, trying to prevent that. Um, yeah. Um, so the lowest temperature that you can get the water, the theoretical minimum, is the wet bulb temperature of the air. And uh, so if you end up in a, a really, really hot day, a really hot, humid day, you can, you can potentially not be able to get the condenser water cool enough. I don't know if they've ever, I doubt that ever happens here, but in a really, really, really hot, humid place, it could, it could happen. Um, and uh, yeah, then there's just some parameters here, how, to, how we describe the uh, performance capabilities of the cooling tower. Um, difference between entering and leaving water is the cooling range. The approach is the difference between the leaving water temperature and the entering wet bulb temperature. And uh, with these parameters, we can define the cooling efficiency of the cooling tower, the range over the uh, approach plus the range. 
And uh, so this is showing uh, the change in the, the temperature of the water in the air as they, as they pass by each other. Um, and here's an, a, an example, and this example is, is worked out for you, so you can use this as a model. You know, as a, uh, I think the, the one in the homework is exactly like this. Um, so we're just, we're just doing a mass of energy balance around the, uh, around the cooling tower. So it's basically energy in equals energy out, and water in equals water out. So it's a lot like what we've done with, with our, our other HVAC calculations. And uh, this equation here for the mass flow rate of dry air through the cooling tower is a common design equation that relates the dry air mass flow to uh, the, the, the water mass flow rate and the, uh, the enthalpies and so on. And that enables you to figure out how much air you need so you can size your fan. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's really all for uh, the supplement. I, I, do, I did want to go into some economics, um, the economics aspects of our system. Um, and uh, there's a couple of aspects of economics that I want to talk about. One is energy, uh, predicting the uh, cost of energy to run your HVAC system. There's a method that we can use to model energy use. And most of it's done now uh, using computer models, but there's a, a sort of a quick and dirty way we can, uh, we can do it. And uh, I'll show you how to do that. And then I want to look at some ways that we can evaluate uh, systems, the, the costs of, you know, how, how do we compare different uh, HVAC systems and uh, evaluate their costs over time and come up with what we call the life cycle cost. So here's a 20 year life cycle cost for operating a chilled water system. And um, so th actually, this is. Uh, actually renting the chilled water. It's, it's not, this is comparing if I acquire my chilled water from a central chilled water supplier versus putting in my own chilled water system, which was going to cost me $220,000. But when I do that, I'm going to have an annual electricity cost. And that cost is going to escalate every year based on the inflation of energy. I'm going to have to do uh, maintenance. Uh, we have an overhaul in the, the middle of the life of the unit. Then we have our annual maintenance, and that inflates at the inflation rate. And then we can calculate a net cash flow, and then we discount the cash flow from the future to the present so we can do a, a, a total life cycle cost. And I'll show you how we do this uh, next, uh, next time. But uh, th this is the kind of thing you really want to do in a spreadsheet to uh, automate the calculations. So you can compare, okay, 20 year life cycle cost of installing my own chilled water system versus 20 year life cycle of, of, of having a supplier supply my chilled water. Yes, I did want to ask for that example, what size was it by chance? The size of the chilled water? Yeah, in that particular uh, example. That problem, uh, the size. Uh, was it like a single cooling tower? I uh, can't remember. Okay. I, I, I actually, I, did, I, yeah, I, I'll try to find it. Oh, no, don't worry. Thank I, you. I'm not sure that you had that I didn't, I didn't know how large a scale the, that particular uh, configuration is. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to. Contact our uh, visitor here. 